Good morning, North River, and welcome to the North River living room this morning. And uh, we're going to do a, a little bit different today. Um, we've been going through the book of Ephesians. We're going to be in chapter 6 today. If you want to put out your Bibles, we're going to be in chapter 6, those first few verses. And we're going to be talking about parenting. But our curriculum group that kind of thinks through our services and our content, we wanted to do something a little bit different today. And instead of having a typical sermon, we're going to have a little bit more of a, a chat around a table with some of our elders. And we're really excited about that because we are a spiritual family here at North River. Amen? Amen. And like in any healthy family, we have leaders that care for us and shepherd over us. And we have 11 amazing elder couples here at North River. And three of them are here with us now. And the scriptures really do teach about the older teaching the younger. And that is biblical. And while that is something that is starting to be extinct in this world, we truly believe in those intergenerational relationships here in this family. And so this morning, uh, we're going to have a little chat and kind of imitate that, where I'm going to be able to, as someone younger, be able to ask my, my wiser brethren and sister in it, for, for wisdom. And we're going to be talking about parenting. And similar to a couple of weeks ago when we talked about marriage, you might go, well, if I'm not a parent, should I just zone out? Well, no, right? This is Paul as a single man that was not a parent talking about these, these very biblical and important matters. And whether you're a parent now or you're hoping to be a parent one day or maybe the, those times have passed where you're not going to be a parent, there's biblical wisdom when the family of God comes together to talk about biblical wisdom when it comes to parenting. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to read uh, in Ephesians chapter 6, our first few verses right here, and then we're going to kind of just jump in and have some time to, to ask for some wisdom and how you guys have led your families and what we can learn from that. So let's jump into Ephesians chapter 6 together. You guys with us? In Ephesians 6, starting in verse 1, it reads, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And all the parents said, <laughs> Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on earth. Now, fathers or parents, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and the instruction of the Lord. So this is our text today, and I'm personally really excited about this because Paul says that a healthy family culture will bring a blessing to parents and their children. And I know you guys have experienced this blessing in y'all's families in so many ways, and I'm excited that we can talk about it today. So before we jump in, uh, can I ask you guys to introduce yourselves and your children and maybe how long you've been here at North River? John and Pam, thanks for having us over, by the way. Uh, for sure, you know. Uh, we're going to have coffee yeah. here in a moment. You know, it's going to be great, but don't spill donuts, on the carpet. Or, yeah. No donuts. All right, all right. Um, so John and Pam Dakota, uh, we've been here since 2001, and we're part of the founding membership that helped start North River. So uh, we have been married. This would be 40 years this year. Amen. Uh, so that's, yeah, kind of cool. We have... Three sons, uh, Stephen, Tyler, and Josh. Uh, Stephen is married and has uh, three kids of his own. Uh, Tyler's the youngest one. He has a new daughter as of November, and they Congrats. live in Seattle with his wife. And then my, our middle son, Josh, lives in Reno. And we're Stephen and Susan Adkins, and we've been in Atlanta, a part of the Atlanta churches for 31 years. And uh, we've got three grown children, Mary Alice, who's married to Grant Hicks, and uh, Paul and Christine. And so that's us. And I'm Ray, and this is my lovely bride, Princess Rowan. And uh, we've been here in Atlanta since, uh, well, we got married in 1990. And uh, we've been a part of the church here at North River for uh, since, I think, 2010. Yeah. And uh, we have two sons, two adult sons. One is 25. He's married. That's Brandon. Just got married this past summer. And my uh, oldest son, Bryce, is 29, and he's working on his PhD at Mount Sinai with uh, uh, genetic epidemiology. Amen. PhD. Yes. Now, he clearly gets that from Princess, right? He of does. course. Of course. <laughs> of course he did. And so, thank you for having us over. Uh, oh, I'm looking for forward sure. to the dinner. North River living room. We're a family, right, guys? So uh, why don't we just jump into this passage? You know, back in Ephesians, um, 
in verse, in verse 4, said, Fathers, do not exasperate your children, but instead bring them up in the training and the instruction of the Lord. So when it comes to that idea of bringing up our children in the training and in the instruction of the Lord, for you guys as you were raising your children, what was like the, the role of the church, the crucial role of the church in y'all's lives to train them up in the Lord? And then what role did you feel like was only you could do as a parent? And what did that look like? Does anyone want to jump into that for us? <laughs> All right, I'll, uh, I'll take a shot. So the best way I know how to, to articulate this is that we moved here in 2001 to be part of a congregation that we perceived to have a really outstanding kids ministry, young, young adult and kids ministry. And um, why did we do that? Because I, I, I felt like we needed help. I read a book, I don't remember when it was, but I read a book by Henry Cloud that was entitled How People Grow. And in that book, what I remember of it is that, that he articulated the idea that essentially it happens in a small group where you got people that can support you, that, that can help you sort of stay on track, and at the same time, when you, when you don't feel like you're doing well, can remind you of why you're good and why, you know, there's, there's a lot of hope for you and things like that. And so it's a very sort of community-based idea. And I, I, we felt like that, that we were missing that a bit. And so I quit the best job I'd had in my life at that time, packed up a, a rider truck. Uh, you know, I turned to Pam and I go, hey, I don't know if we're going to be bankrupt in six months or it's going to be a great move, but thanks for coming. <laughs> so, so we came down here, and it's been, it's been wonderful. It's been amazing. But so, so that context of having people, um, that was a big motivation, and, and we felt like our kids would need people to talk to other than us. Uh, so that part was the church part. Now, when they come home from church that's on us. What they see in the home and what it's like for them and uh, how we relate to them, if there's not consistency there, then that's on us. And so we, you know, worked hard to do that. Uh, there you go. What would you add? I, I, I love the things John shared. When, uh, when, when we strive to love God, it means loving his people. We can't love God if we don't love his people. And we can't love his people if we don't love God. So the, uh, what, what the church provides, uh, the, the church can provide the assemblies, the schedules, some events, uh, great, great friends, great uh, mentors, uh, great spiritual examples. But ultimately at home, the kids learn to love God from their parents yeah. Yeah. and they learn to love the church from their parents so I just think about uh, about all the things that Susan and I did to uh, to make the church a priority to make the church a real priority because we want our children to grow up loving the church and loving God and uh, like for instance Wednesday nights are tricky for, uh, you know, midweek services are tricky, especially for families with young, young children. And I can remember, uh, I mean, there's the whole bedtime issue. <laughs> that's, that's a thing. Yeah, bedtime that's a thing. A, that's a thing. So uh, I can remember uh, us bringing their pajamas, and we change them into their pajamas right after, uh, right after church because, in fact, sometimes we even brought them to, ki to, to Kingdom Kids in their pajamas. Because there was going to be some fellowship afterward, and then there was going to be bundling up in the car seats, and they're conking out on the way home, and we have to lift them out, and, and so we didn't have to change them. Yeah. I, I can remember a time where uh, one of our children has, um, has uh, some significant health uh, issues, and, um, and, and we... Uh, Susan felt like I, I need to get her home uh, a little bit earlier than after church. So we, we decided, okay, we're going to uh, we're going to go to church in two cars. 
uh, and, and she'll leave at 8. So that was halfway through the service and, and get um, our daughter home and, and, and get her to bed because for her health, that was a priority. But we wanted every one of the children to have their church experience. We wanted them to see that church is important, even if we can't make all of it, even if we can't do everything. Uh, the church is a priority. And so she would leave halfway through, and then I would stay through and bring the other two children home later. Uh, I can think of, of a, a lot of things we did just to make it possible that the children could grow up learning to love God by loving the church. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I know even for us to have little kids right now and all of our friends that we know that battle of trying to get our kids there. You know what it's going to mean for you the next morning with those little kids. And yet seeing the example that you guys set in that over the years and what that's produced, I'm just grateful we have those examples in our lives. And by the way, there are different challenges with three teen teenage children than three young children. <laughs> Amen. I, does it ever change from challenge? Anyways, we'll, we'll get to that. We'll, we'll, let's move on to our next uh, question. So... In that verse, though, so the second half of verse 4 was talking about training, instructing the Lord. But the first part said, fathers, do not exasperate your children. Now, we know that uh, it's not only fathers that can exasperate our children, but also mothers. But, but the verse says fathers, right? Um, so why don't I ask you this, Ray? You know, for all parents, but especially for fathers, what does it mean to exasperate our children? And how can we set a healthy culture of obedience, honor, and respect without exasperating them. Well, thank you, John. I, I think for me, I, I'm going to take that question this way. I think one of the things that happened here is, um, would come to my mind, why did Paul say fathers do not exasperate your kids, mm -hmm. your children? Why? I think because we will exasperate our kids. <laughs> and I think the, the, the help of the a healthy mindset there. I think one, I'm going to share a bet, an example where I didn't, I didn't do the right thing. And I did exasperate one of my sons, and my youngest son, Brandon. I think there was a time with a rhythm that we had in our home that, uh, that it was a dinner time table. That's where everything came out. We spill our guts. Whatever happened to it at work or at school or whatever, that was the time that we got it all out. They got it out. And there was one time at this particular dinner time we, where we were talking, had a discussion, and uh, uh, we was uh, I don't quite know what the discussion was on, but we were, it started getting heated up. And as always, those discussions, we were talking about life, they get heated up. And this particular time, it kept getting heated up, heated up even more. And my youngest son, Brandon, kept, um, Prince and I were talking, and he just kept butting in. And so I said, okay, yeah, yeah, Prince, this is that. Yeah, he kept, <laughs> and then it kept going over and over and on. And I felt that he was probably trying to protect his mom. But there was no need of that protection. But he felt that was his way he had to do this. But it got to the point that it got so heated up that I grabbed him by his throat. Mm. And I said, look, enough is enough. Mm. OK, you need to listen. Now, I'm not recommending fathers you go home and grab your son by their throat, OK? That <laughs> is Homer not, that is <laughs> not, you know, it's not what Paul is <laughs> telling us to do, OK? Or asking us not to do that. But I think what happened for me was that it was, I was glad that that exposure helped happen because, not for him, but for me, because it helped me to see that some things, that there's still some hidden sin there that was there, that lack of self-control, anger, all those things were still there. And even though we discussed a lot of things, but when it, what ended up happening, we, I did get some help. I talked with, uh, we, we, our family got with Bob and, uh, Bob and Jackie came at the time. I think Jackie was sick. And well, we got a chance to talk to, through those things there. And now, to make a long story short, um, I think one of the things, too, that came out of that was that we did give each other space, but we still have those life discussions. You know, even today, now, my son Bryce, the oldest one, he will call me right before he having a meeting with some of his professors. Why? I do not know anything about genetic epidemiology. <laughs> But he's a researcher, and but he still call. He still want to talk, and we have those life discussions right before some of his meetings, and sporadically. Now, why would a 29 year old want to call his old dad for something like that? Why? Because he was brought up that way. 
and he wants that, he still wants that connection with us. Amen. Thank you for sharing that. And I just appreciate you sharing that, you know, that concept of exasperating. So many times there's a hidden sin in us that we might not even know is there, but it comes out into our children or at our children or with our children. And so one of the best ways to create a healthy culture is actually to really dig down and let Christ transform us. Exactly. So that health is coming out instead of those hidden sins coming out. Appreciate that. Um, you know, in this passage, there's only a few short verses on parenting, but we know it's such a, a bigger topic and a, rather than just these first few passages. So why don't we use this as a springboard? And I'd love to ask some of the moms here. Um, you know, when I was asking Toya, hey, what would be so good for, you know, for the moms to hear and what's something that's oftentimes a struggle? You know, for all parents, but especially for moms, it's so easy to lose your identity and your own spirituality as a mom. And what helped you girls, or women, what helped you? Is that okay? Is that all right? That's perfectly fine. Why'd y'all laugh? No, I'm just... All right, so what helped you navigate your own walk with God and all the demands of being a mom, especially when you're a young mom, with grace? And also, what did your husbands do to support you so that you can maintain that part of your walk with God and who you are with all the demands of being a mom? So, yeah. I think another name for motherhood is otherhood. <laughs> Honestly, when you think about how much of our energy and and our heart everything goes to making sure that our children are safe their family is fed and then now for you younger moms something that we didn't have um, is just all of the highlight reels and social media mm. and all the comparison that can take place right. i mean i did my own share of comparing you know, when I went to pick my kids up from school or go into the store or whatever. But it's very easy to forget who you are when you're a mom. And I'm, I'm, I'm in this, I'm in some art programs right now that I'm really enjoying. And what I'm, you know, one of the things that they had us do is to think about what is it that you really love? And I sat there for a minute and it took me a while to put this board together you know, to really take the time to think about it because so much of my energy goes into thinking, what would someone so enjoy? What would this person love? And, and I feel like what I'm learning and what I learned through the years in my relationship with God is I'm, I'm sitting here, I'm 60 years old, and I'm still trying to understand that my identity is in God yeah. and not in what I accomplish and not in you know, what my kids do and how that reflects back on me. And, you know, and just in the same way that, you know, my art has many layers and many mistakes and many things that I do in all of that, my life has reflected that as well. And, you know, every mile mattered, but it's, but the mistakes aren't the things that define me. And what, what can, those mistakes, even in my art, the mistake can be the thing that I end up loving the most if I don't give up on that and I continue to look at that and process it and think, how, what can I do with this? And I can do the same thing in my life and your kids are watching you with that. And the, the other thing that I think is so important that I learned was to lean into, when I didn't know what to do as a mom, I could, I could lean into love because God is love. Mm -hmm. And I know if I'm loving, then that is the right thing. I could take my kids out and we could play need meters and we could go to the store and see who we could help. And, and we could read the newspaper together and learn about a fire and take some of our toys and give them to those kids that didn't have toys. And even though I was messing up in a lot of different things, my kids saw that I was trying. And it has given them space to make mistakes and the courage to try as well, I hope. Amen. Amen. Yes, thank you. Well, for me, when one of my 
one of the most important things for me is trying to grow in my walk with God at every phase of my life. And, you know, when you're a young mom, that presents a lot of challenges, but also opportunities. <laughs> but, and, you know, I really tried to learn from other moms. I can remember, you know, with newborns, somebody said, you know, when you sit down to nurse or sit down to give a bottle, have a Bible on the table beside you and read while you're, you're with your baby. And then um, I can remember a phase of just taking advantage of whatever opportunities you had, a phase where you'd get up at, you know, two to feed the baby, and I would stay awake for another 15, half, 30 minutes and read and pray because that was just a little opportunity that God had given me. I can remember... You know, knowing that things are different, I can remember Judy Duckworth telling me that when she was, her kids were little, she would kneel at the side of her bed to pray, and they would slide down her back while she was praying. <laughs> and I thought, okay, I don't have to go to the mountain for an hour and have a prayer time. It is whatever it is. <laughs> but that just helped me so much to learn from other women. And, and, you know, during the carpool years, my prayer time was often in the car, maybe with them or after I dropped them off. And, but through all these times, God didn't exactly look the same as he had been at another time, or my time with him didn't look the same. But I still, I was constantly encouraged by this verse in Isaiah 40, verse 11. It says, he tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers Okay, this one always makes me cry. He gathers his lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those who have young. And I thought, um, I know, I knew that God knew that there are times in our lives that just need special care and special adjustment. And that just, that just helped me so much in my walk with God and, and knowing that even though it was challenging and I may not have had a shower in two days and, you know, no telling what's in my hair, you know, God, I could, God was still with me and I could do the best I could with the strength I had for that day. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Okay. It's powerful. It's very powerful. And it's so encouraging to know that there's seasons in life. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think that's, that's really important for us that are younger to realize that we, it's harder for us to understand because we've kind of only had one season. Right. But you guys can show us how to, how to not only just to survive the hard seasons, but to thrive in it, even if the thriving looks very different. Mm -hmm. So thank you for showing us that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's keep on going here. You know, several of you guys were really grateful to have shared about your weaknesses mm -hmm. or your mistakes in parenting. And that's something as we were talking about, you know, uh, no, no one's perfect. And, and our elders, they're not appointed because they're perfect, but because their walk with God has lasted to, to, to maturity through the imperfections. Right. And you all have kept on growing and you've kept on striving and you've kept on maturing over time. And that's the example we learn from. So I'd love to ask, you know, in parenting, what are some weaknesses or mistakes that you've had in your family life? or things that you might go back and do differently in your parenting that we could learn from as a younger generation? Oh, yeah. I can share on that. <laughs> you know, there are so many ways that I can look back on my years as a, as a mama, and even still I'm a mama, um, and, and see mistakes and things that I made. And I think one of the, the biggest things is that um, if I could do it over, it would have been just being more um, curious and less reactionary. Mm. And, you know, Stephen and Tyler were our birth sons. And, you know, we adopted Josh when he was like between seven and nine. Um, we had two different birth dates for him, but he was very small, didn't speak English, couldn't read, and so we went with the younger birthday. And as you can imagine, for a child who's missed their formative years with loving parenting 
and all of that, there were a lot of things that were difficult for him. And, and it was so hard not to take like different behaviors that he would do and feel afraid that it was gonna reflect poorly on me as a person. And mm -hmm. so I would react because there was this fear that I had and I parented a lot from a place of fear. And in mm -hmm. 2002, um, we had a family tragedy. Uh, my niece and nephew and their two little cousins and their aunt were hit by a train and they all died. And it was horrible. And we had just moved here. We didn't have many friends. And how do people approach you and become your friend with a loss like that? It was mm -hmm. really difficult. And, and just the reality that something that bad could happen it was so scary. And, and so there, it, it just, I, be, I could feel it like making me even more like a helicopter mom mm -hmm. and feeling fearful. And having um, John in my life has helped so much because, you know, he, he could remind me of what's true about God, of what's true about me, and, and that, and part of the truth was learning to come to a place of acceptance that things can happen, they really can happen, but that, that, that we can survive them, we can learn from them, we can grow from them, and so can our, our kids. But that would be the thing, especially with Josh, I wish that I had been more curious because um, I think it would have expressed more love to him and more room for him to ask you know, to, to act out or to do the things that he needed to do to sort out who he was as a person. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mr. Schenner? I'd like to add. Yeah, please. Um, and this comes from feedback from our sons, you know, over the years. Uh, I, I'm gonna claim to be, and I'm gonna use this language, uh, a left brain oriented person. Uh, so for those of you out there like that, uh, order uh, systems, uh, processes, uh, right? Okay. I never uh, would have guessed that. I know, you, I know, right? <laughs> Hard to believe. My, my favorite Far Side cartoon is is Gary Larson drew a bunch of sheep standing in a living room with a dog at the door, and and the hostess is saying to her husband, Harry, nobody knows where to stand or what to do or what to eat, and they look at the oh, thank goodness, there's a border collie. So, <laughs> you know, I'm the border collie. Yeah. <laughs> now. A lot of benefits to a border collie, a lot of downsides. Uh, I also, look, if you're a parent, God bless you. Uh, <laughs> it is, uh, I, I parented every day with a fear in my gut that I was gonna get it wrong. Thankfully, I, I had a lot of people around me to help me. Mm -hmm. and so that said, um, that fear, it, it, it didn't go away. Um, and so my reaction to things was primarily more 1 John 5, 3, this is how we know we love God, by obeying his commands, and his commands are not burdensome. All right, well, let's just obey the commands. Let's just get back to what we're supposed to be doing. Let's just get back into a process and a system. And, and even when I would hear at church that kind of thing talked about, I would go, yep, see, there it is. I would grab onto that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, Susan talking about God picking you up as a lamb and carrying you around and that kind of a thing, I was like, I don't even know what that is. Uh, that's... That's some nice words, but I cannot identify with that. That, that is where I think that Pam was and is a benefit to me because she, she helps me get in touch with sort of that other side of my brain, uh, as do many of you. And so I'm grateful for that. All right, so the weakness there is that that has an impact on the family and how the family thinks about things, you know? Um, it, it's fine to think about the bigger picture and to have a higher level of empathy and a higher level of patience and, 
and allowing people to be who they are and appreciating them for that and not viewing that as a weakness, right? Um, so hopefully between the two of us, we made a whole person and, you know, uh, here we are. <laughs> I will say that, that I noticed that our, our sons are better at that than I was. And credit to you. Thank you so Thank much, you. guys, for sharing. Mm -hmm. So we got time for about uh, one more question here, and I really appreciate you guys sharing your weaknesses and your, and your mistakes, but you're up here in, in your elders that we look to because of the principles and the values that you did set into your family culture and your family rhythms that, that prove so much benefit and blessings in your kid's life and in your family. And so I'd love to ask that as a last question. What are some of the principles and values that had the most positive impact over the years in your parenting, and how did that bring you blessing? I'll answer yeah, please us, answer. for the Rowans. Um, yeah. One big value that was very positive for our family was having dinner together. Yeah. Yeah. Was, that was the most important thing during the day, is yeah. just having dinner together and gathering at the table <laughs> and talking, being real, not sugarcoating anything. Whatever they saw in us, they let us know, vice versa, or whatever the week pertained to. We were always open, and they could ask us anything. Amen. And it was just like, that was the highlight of the day, is just spending time with them. And that we really value. To this day, we still talk, the real talk. And then another thing was the community, whether it being the church, at school, because some reason in our neighborhood, our house was a house that all the kids came to. Yep. We had no idea. I was like, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> you know, at the dinner tables, like, who are you? <laughs> and they said, oh, this is our friend so-and-so from the neighborhood. Or at school, it was crazy. We had these Asian guys, little boys, come over yeah, and spend time with our kids. And they were like, and the mom, she was a single mom, and she was like, I trust you. I love your family. I love your boys. We would love them to come over and spend the night. And I'm like, really? <laughs> and, and that's just how it was. I guess people could actually see the love in us, mm. how much we really care for people. I love kids. And it's just... It was just amazing how God just, you know, allowed us to have people in our homes, disciples in our homes. Their kids will spend the night. It would be like, can we spend the night with you guys, you know, your boys? But that was the thing. We just, we just left our house open. So the community played a big part in us in raising our kids. Amen. Can I add one thing with that? Yeah, I think, too, I would talk to Bryce last night to them and want to get some of his uh, feedback from him. And one of the things that he shared too, not only with community, but he said that one of the things that he thought was that we allow them to, uh, to we taught them to stand up for what they believe in, if it's correct. Mm -hmm. And I think how did that shows up is that we actually need to stand, stand up for what you believe in, despite what popular culture may say, or despite what peer pressure might say. And, and what happened is, even now, and as, as he's gotten older, he shared a couple of things, too. They said, well, look, Dad, look what's happening now. You know, I'm standing up here. I'm doing this project. Actually, my proposal about this PhD that I'm working on is about diversity in research, diversity in research in medicine for, um, for communities. And yes, everybody said, yes, I'm doing these things. I'm going to do this. But most of the research is done behind European. So now he's making a stand and saying, okay, hey, my research is going to be on diversity with, these, with some of these medications and stuff. And, and I think that's just how he's making an impact now in the future Amen. because of what the values that we had, he had earlier. Amen. That's amazing. I, I just got a little uh, brief part to add. Um, so... Uh, I love that verse in Ephesians 6 because it charges the fathers to raise the children yeah. in, the, in the fear and instruction of the Lord. And so, uh, so uh, while Susan had more time with the children, 
Um, as soon as I got home from work, I was, I was on to engage with the children, take something off her hands. Um, I mean, raising these children is my, my responsibility. And uh, praise God for, for my wife, who, who did uh, an incredible job. But I wasn't going to, you know, just leave it all to her. Now, let me just, oh, you know what? I think I'll leave it there. And... Um, Bro, if you got one more thing you want to say, you got okay. it, bro. It's okay. <laughs> one of the things you learn as a parent is that you've got to pick your battles. You ever heard that? Yeah. You got to pick your battles. And yet, how do you pick your battles? It seems like there are so many battles. True. There's so many things, whether they're young or middle school or high school, it seems like there's just an endless sequence of things you could correct in your children. And so what, what Susan and I did is we just thought of, look, there are these three priorities that we do with our children. We, we love them, we teach them, we discipline them. Yeah. And we, we, we thought of it in our mind as uh, three layers in a pyramid. So that the discipline was, a, was the small, you know, cap on top. We need to have the big foundation of love. And so when I would come home from school, there would sometimes be an issue brewing. I mean, when I came home from work, uh, there would sometimes be an issue brewing. Right. You know what I mean? Something happened yeah, at, yeah. at home and someone's in their room and yeah. whatever. But, <laughs> but uh, I would always have to ask myself, what is the shape of my relationship with my children? Right? Is it a time to, uh, to give them a big hug, you know, and, and show compassion? And, uh, and, and, or, or is it time to, uh, to correct them, uh, you know, decisively? <laughs> uh, and, and I always had to say, look, uh, when they look back on their childhood, they want to know that their father and mother loved them. Amen. And then they will appreciate the teaching, and then they will value the discipline Amen. that we yeah. administered. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> I'm glad you shared that last part, bro. That was, yeah. that was amazing. Yeah, that was good. <laughs> so thank you so much, guys. And church, listen, we have so many amazing, mature brothers and sisters in our congregation that have been through life, that have been through being single, they've been through campus, they've been through being young parents, they've been through having middle school and high school parents, they've been through even having their kids leave the house that we can learn from. Uh, let, let this experience be a springboard for you to, to get, to have a mature couple into your living room to ask questions and to get help from. It's something that we deeply believe as a congregation. While the world is segregating and dividing on every element possible, we're trying to unite. And we, we want to be intergenerational in this family where we can truly learn from each other and be vulnerable and ask questions. I know Toy and I are so blessed to have older men and women in our life that have been through life that can teach us so that we can learn from them. And especially just from the congregation to you three elder couples and all of our elders, thank you so much for your life. Thank you so much for your example and what you shared. And in closing, what we'll do here, guys, is, is Ray, can I ask you to pray over us and over our, our kids in the congregation as a close? Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jordan, as well. Um, please pray, Ray. God, thank you so much for this opportunity where we could discuss um, at, at, at a dinner table, so to speak, uh, about things that are going on in our lives, things that are happening around us that uh, helped us become better parents, things, mistakes that we did, things that we didn't do right, but yet you're still there with us. We thank you so much for your love, your patience. God, I pray, too, for uh, just a couple of things that are happening here. Uh, we, we pray for uh, Bob Mullins, uh, Michelle Dobbs' uh, fa father, who had two, uh, two strokes this past week. We pray, God, that you help him become healed and recover from that. Uh, we pray for the family that they'll be able to be healed as well. God, I pray, too, for our, this community here and 
uh, on Amy Drive just this uh, week. We had two people that were killed, and and I, I pray for that in this community here, Lord, that, that you have blessed, helped those family and healed them, Lord, those that are involved in that accident here on Amy Drive. God, uh, we pray that a special prayer for these people here, Lord, please help them protect them. God, and, and I pray that as parents that we can draw closer and draw near to you. We love you, and this we ask in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.